hardly a week goes by without media and scholarly reference to the future prospects of human embryonic stem cell investigation. Attracting an equal share of attention are the future dilemmas, some would say nightmares, posed by this research. Our speaker this evening is Professor James Thompson, one of the world's leading authorities on this subject, and certainly the principal pioneer in the field. Professor Thompson graduated from the University of Illinois in 1981, and he received a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1988. He is currently a professor in the University of Wisconsin Medical School and at the Wisconsin Regional Primate Research Center. In 1998, Professor Thompson took spare, fertilized eggs left over from IVF procedures and created from them the first human embryonic stem cell lines. These are pluripotent vehicles capable in theory of producing a vast array of body parts, conceivably programmed for therapeutic usage in cases where the patient lacks some serviceable organ. In the process, however, human pre-embryos are destroyed, tempering medical optimism with social, perhaps even theological, disputation. We have since learned that human pre-embryos can be created by a, by a somatic cell nuclear transfer i.e. cloning, so that stem cell controversies are now, are now fused with cloning controversies. This evening, Professor Thompson will provide us with insights as to the new science for which he is so greatly responsible, and during the question and answer period, he will favor us with his observations regarding the profound ethical, legal, and political dimensions of his research. Please provide a warm welcome for Professor James Thompson. Thanks. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me back. The last time I was in this room, I was watching cheap movies on Saturday nights. And they're kind of going in the back of my brain right now, so it's hard to do the talk. What I want to do is explain what embryonic stem cells are, where they come from, and why I think they're important. And this will be kind of a mixed talk because I think most of you probably are not biologists, but some of you are. So I'll talk a little bit about the work going on in my lab at kind of a biology level. Um, but most of the talk will be kind of a general overview. So to understand where embryonic stem cells come from, you really have to understand only the first week or so of development. And after fertilization, there's a series of cleavage, cleavage divisions where each of these orange-red blastomeres have the developmental potential. Speak into what you want to bring more time. I want to use this one. Okay. Try again. You hear me better in the back now? No. Okay, I'll use this one. So each of these orange-red blastomeres has the developmental potential to form anything in the whole body. And right at the time of implantation, the first differentiation event occurs. So that's when this this green layer comes off. And that's what's called the tropectoderm, and it gives rise to the outer layer of placenta, and it's committed to becoming that thing. So this, this happens in all about a week in, in humans or, or in other mammals. And it, because it happens in only about a week, these cells are really not acting as stem cells because they're dividing for a very short period of time. And then through the process of gastrulation, they go on and become other things. They're not really functioning as stem cells. They're functioning as precursor cells. However, if you take them out of the intact embryo and you put them under artificial tissue culture conditions, you can get them to maintain this embryonic phenotype of being able to form anything in the whole body, and they'll self-renew as far as we know forever. In a nutshell, that's what embryonic stem cells are. And this is a picture of human embryonic stem cells, and there's probably, I don't know, 10,000 cells in this very compact colony here. So embryonic stem cells have two basic properties that makes them important. One is they're immortal. They'll divide, as far as we know, forever. And this is unusual for human cells. Mouse cells spontaneously mortalize at a reasonably frequent, high frequency. Human cells don't. And if you take, say, a fibroblast from your skin and you put it into tissue culture, it'll divide. But it'll divide a fairly set characteristic number of times, usually 60, 70 population doubling times, something like that. And then it undergoes something called senescence. Embryonic stem cells, because they're derived early enough in development, they have all the machinery needed to not undergo senescence, and it has to do with maintaining telomerins, an enzyme called telomerase, which this is an example of an assay for that enzyme. 
And people have taken our original cell lines from 1998 and taken them out for over 500 population doubling times and never seen something like senescence. So they can be expanded without known limit. And the second property related to that is they're, they're karyotypically normal. If you look at cancer cells, they always have genetic changes and there's various degrees of changes. Uh, but these cells will divide without known limit and they have normal karyotypes. Now there's, there's nothing that's forever and any cell that divides has the possibility of undergoing mutation and these can be accumulated over time. Uh, but they're remarkably stable and they're normal for a very long time. So you can grow as many as you want. So the other property that everybody knows about is they can form anything in the whole body. And one of the ways you can show this is to by injecting a mouse that lacks an immune system and they form a little disorganized growth called a teratoma. And within these teratomas, there's disorganized tissues from all three germ layers. So the germ cells, the germ layers, as you recall, are endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And these are um, histology sections of examples of those from human teratomas. So endoderm includes things like gut-like structures. And the important thing here is not only are the gut cells forming, which is these luminal cells here, uh, but the, this wall of mesenchyme is actually coalescing into a layer of smooth muscle. So there's actually not only the ability to form individual cells, but a great deal of communication going beyond between different cell layers and forming these vast structures. So mesoderm includes things like bone marrow and bone in this panel, kidney, and you can't see it very well because of the magnification, but these are very well formed glomeruli. Um, striated muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, um, and cartilage. Ectoderm has a variety of derivatives, but this is an example of one of my favorite ones, and this is a cap bud tooth, uh, a cap tooth bud and it has all the appropriate layers, of appropriate organization. If you looked at this little box area, you can actually see the dentin between the amyloblasts and the odontoblasts. So these cells can form, as far as we know, anything in the body, and you can grow as many as you want to. So why are these important? And there's three basic reasons. I'll try to keep coming back to these through the talk and give you examples of each of them. The first one, and, this, and I'm trained as a development biologist, so this is an important one to me. Human S cells provide a tissue culture model for understanding the differentiation and function of human tissue. If you think about it, it's been extraordinarily difficult to study cells from the human body simply because of access. Most cells that you take out of the body divide relatively poor, poorly, and there's a whole bunch of post-mitotic cells in the body that are interesting, like heart cells and neurons and things. So it simply gives you better access. And this is a theme I want to come back to. Once we have that access, one of the things you want to do with it is use it for drug discovery. You generally use animal models for this now, but there's, there are very significant species differences for certain tissues between humans and, say, mice. And I'll come back to a specific example of that. And then finally, what you read about in the press mostly is that human ES cells could provide a potentially unlimited source of cells for transplantation therapies. And I want to kind of go through in fair detail the challenges that this faces and then come back to the other two and say why I think in the scheme of things it's more important. So these in challenges include making the cell type of interest. This one I think is going to be relatively easy in the scheme of things. I think development of biology will be able to make most of the clinically relevant cells in the body within a decade or so. There's been a huge amount of progress even in the last five years, and as more and more investigators start doing this, I think that'll be fairly simple. However, I think that in the next decade, there'll be relatively few clinical trials based on these cells because of all the other challenges that we have to overcome, and these other challenges are going to be the hard ones. So one is safety concerns, and these include cancer. If you take a cell line and you put it into tissue culture, during prolonged proliferation, you accumulate mutations. And there's actually selective pressures for things that proliferate faster because that's what you're going to passage every time. So if you think about a disease like diabetes, um, there's already a transplantation therapy for diabetes. And if you could just make a better cell type, you could feed it into the transplantation therapy. But if you're diagnosed with a type 1 juvenile onset diabetes, you live a long, productive life. And it's true that the end of a life have pretty serious complications and your average lifespan is 10 or so years less. Um, but nonetheless, you live a long productive life with existing technology. Now, if you introduce some cells to try to cure that condition, actually introduce to cancer, um, pancreatic cancer tends to be rapidly fatal. So you gotta be really sure that the thing you're trying to cure isn't, um, what, the, what you introduce is actually worse than what you're trying to cure. So this one, I think, will stop a lot of, not stop therapies, but it'll make them a lot longer to bring to fruition in, in clinics. Immune rejection is one that gets talked a lot about. I think this will be, well, not a minor problem. I think there's a number of people with different strategies to get around that one. 
Um, you can use existing immunosuppressive therapies used with standard organ transplantation, and you can feed into those programs. If you think about some of the um, neural transplants that have been done with fetal tissue, they're actually, those, those immunosuppressive therapies are tolerated quite well right now, and that's not the limiting factor. You can, you can get the cells to engraft, it's just they don't function appropriately. Now, the next two, I think, are hard, and I, I was trained in part as a pathologist, and if you, if you have cells that die in the body, there's a reason for it. And if you don't understand the underlying cause, if you simply put the exact same cells back into the same environment, there's a good chance that they also are going to die. And correcting the underlying cause could be challenging, and it's going to be very disease-specific. And for a lot of these diseases, we don't understand the underlying cause. So for example, in juvenile onset diabetes, um, there's people saying that you can use so-called therapeutic cloning and make genetically identical cells and use it for diabetes. Well, diabetes is an autoimmune process. And there's already good evidence if you put genetically identical cells back into the body, they'll get rejected again. So you have to somehow get around that. And, and I think that'll be challenging for most diseases. And related to that is, is integration in a physiological useful form. If you think about the brain, um, I, I'm optimistic that someday people think about transplantations to the brain that will work. But it's such a complicated organ to recapitulate all the normal co connections and reestablish function might be a little on the optimistic side. So let's talk about some of the specific lineages we can do today and, and, and where they fit into these levels of challenges. So Igor Slutkin and Dan Kaufman are two investigators that started off at Wisconsin. Dan's now at Minnesota. He can already show that human ES cells can differentiate readily to, a, I think, all of the major blood cell types of the body now. I think T and B cells have been kind of hard, but we have some evidence of that. And even if you don't know anything about blood, if you just look at this colony up here, this is an erythroid colony, and it's red not because we stained it with anything, but it's actually expressing adult uh, hemoglobin. In the bottom right is a megakaryocytic uh, colony, and that's what gives rise to platelets, and it's actually stained with a marker that's specific to platelets and megakaryocytes. If you think about the red cross, those are the two blood cell types you're actually donating. And some back-of-the-envelope calculations suggest to us that it's not entirely impractical just to manufacture blood products. Already, even with just technicians using standard tissue culture technology, we can generate a surprising amount of blood cells. Um, and if you think about those challenges I went through, blood cells don't have them. So you don't need physiological integration in a complicated three-dimensional way. You can just put the blood cells back in. Cancer is not a problem because both red blood cells and platelets don't have nuclei. MHC matching is not a problem. You just have to do blood typing. Um, so this is one that could be relatively easy. Um, nonetheless, there's a, 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 the cost of manufacture is likely to be high, and right now blood products are free except for all the processing charges because people donate them. At the opposite end of the expression in complexity is the central nervous system. So Su Shen Zhang at UW and, and a number of investigators now have already shown that human ES cells can differentiate to dopaminergic, dopaminergic neurons at a very high frequency, and this is the neuron that's defective in Parkinson's disease. Um, he can make on order 30% of a culture dopaminergic neurons. And since you can make as many ES cells as you want, you can make as many as this neuron. And they function at least in a limited way. Um, normally, they secrete dopamine and they have an appropriate electrophysiology. Similarly, Sushen can also make motor neurons at a, a very high frequency. And these are, um, they express the appropriate repertoire of genes and they have appropriate electrophysiology. And, and motor neurons is the defect in ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, if you think about Lou Gehrig's disease or, or Parkinson's, um, they're both very specific for specific neurons. But in Parkinson's, where the cell body lives and where the projection goes are a couple centimeters away. And if you really want to reestablish that circuitry back to a normal level, you had to figure out some way to grow along that distance. And in, in ALS, or, or um, for the motor neurons, the problem's even worse because these are some of the longest cell in your body. They go from your spinal cord down to your, say, your leg muscles, for example. So even though it makes sense that these grew up from an embryo, it was kind of an all-in-one process thing. To actually get them to do it in the adult, I think, will be extremely challenging. So let's talk about one area where I think um, these cells can make a difference today. And I'll again walk through each of these examples. And this is heart disease. And Tim Camp is an MD, PhD that's been collaborating with me at this on a number of years now. And heart disease is the number one killer in the United States and in my home state of Wisconsin. And the prevalence is increasing because our population is increasing. And our, our health care costs associated with one disease is enormous. It's, over, it's like about $400 billion. And even if everybody signed up for heart donation programs, there's a severe mismatch between the availability of the organs and the need because it's such a prevalent disease. 
in, in the adult heart does not have a stem cell. There is some evidence of limited proliferation, but if you have a heart attack, it doesn't repair itself. You get scar tissue, and that's the bottom line. So human yes cells spontaneously differentiate to cardiomyocytes at a very reasonable frequency. And we're a little bit ignorant about the underlying molecular mechanisms, but there's straightforward ways to purify these cells. And because we can grow as many of the embryonic stem cells as we want, we can now derive as many human cardiomyocytes as we want. Now, cardiomyocytes, there are no human heart cell lines at all uh, because, again, they're post-mitotic and they don't grow and they don't divide. And there's simply no other accurate human model for this. If you want to study the myocardium directly, what you've historically been limiting to is, is biopsy material. And the biopsy material is in very limited amounts, and it's almost always from diseased specimens because that's why they're doing the biopsy in the first place. Um, so it's been very, very difficult to study human cardiomyocytes directly. And there are people that think we can one day introduce these back into the heart in a physiological useful form and repair um, heart attacks. Uh, but again, if you think about that disease, it's not the cardiomyocytes per se that are defective, it's the blood supply that ended up creating an anoxic environment and that killed the cardiomyocytes. Um, so you really have to repair it all in some reasonable way to restore physiological function. And there's people thinking about all the processes we have to go through between you know, differentiating the cells and purify them and doing the appropriate animal models and you know, testing this. Um, the bottom line here is that it's going to be very challenging. These things are not going to happen in the next five years, at least um, not realistically. So what will happen in the next five years? I want to give you this one example because it's something that we are working on at Wisconsin. And this um, in part comes out of Craig January's work, who's an MD, PhD on campus. And if you look at a normal ECG, there's a series of little squiggles that are alphabetically labeled from P, Q, R, S, and T. And there's a series of drugs that interfere with the underlying physiology of the heart that resulted in a prolongation of two of these intervals from Q to T. So it's called prolonged QT polarization. And if you prolong it long enough and severe enough, you can enter this chaotic arrhythmia called torsades de Pons. And this arrhythmia, the blood pressure drops because it's no longer a coordinated contraction of the myocardium, and your blood pressure drops long enough, you die. And there's been a series of drugs that have to be withdrawn from the market after they got to the market, which is exactly what drug companies don't want. They want to pull these things early in the drug discovery process. And this is an example of a patient in the, the clinic at Wisconsin. She was in church and collapsed. And she was resuscitated by the, the EMTs and brought to the clinic. And this is what her ECG looked like. Again, it had this chaotic arrhythmia called Tursan de Pont, and associated with it, the blood pressure is crashing here. Well, this woman was on an antihistamine called a stemazole, and it turns out that the metabolite of the stemazole is responsible for this condition. And it was part Craig's study of this woman and some other things that led to the withdrawal of a stemazole from the market. So if you think about it, this is a, a drug for you know, the sniffles, and people are dying from heart attacks because of this connection to the underlying physiology. So it's very important to pick those out. And this is not an isolated case. Um, Craig tested a whole bunch of drugs that had problems over the years. And um, what's listed in this column is the binding affinity to the particular receptor that's responsible for this effect called a HERG channel. And Craig's developed an ex vivo assay for doing this. And at the top of the list is a stemisol. But here's a whole other series of drugs. And all the ones with red marks next to them are things that are already on the market that had to be withdrawn because of this one particular cardiotoxicity effect. And again, most of these are things like antihistamines and not for major conditions. So you want to make them really, really safe. So it's been a major problem. And Craig has designed a um, particular channel assay based on this HERG channel. Um, it's not in my myocytes on it completely unrelated cell line, and it's pretty good at picking up this problem. But you really want to test drugs in the normal human cardiomyocytes to see, you know, does it interfere in some other unanticipated way with electrophysiology. So Tim Camp, another collaborator, has looked at these cardiomyocytes that we derive from human embryonic stem cells, and if you look at different bits of the, cardio <clears throat> of the heart, you can see that there's different um, specific patterns of electrophysiology depending on whether from the ventricle of the atrial or the nodal areas. And each of these traces are from different cardiomyocytes derived from human embryonic stem cells in tissue culture, and they recapitulate the normal electrophysiology of different regions of the heart. So the, all the ionic channels are there and they're coordinating it appropriately. This is a little dif difficult slide, 
Um, but the bottom line is that this drug here is a blocker of this herd channel. And the differences in these two traces represents blocking of the herd channel. So we can pick that up in these cardiomyocytes and develop a very robust assay about that particular channel's electrophysiology. But it's not limited to this channel. It's any other effect in the heart that you want to do. And I have to, as, as a full disclosure, mention that Craig and I and Tim Camp have founded a company recently in this area because we think it's um, a very important first application for human embryonic stem cells. So back to why human ES cells are important, and I'll get to the last one now and kind of merge into the work that I actually do. So human ES cells provide a tissue culture model for understanding the differentiation of function of human tissue. And here are two embryos. The left one's a human embryo and the right one's a mouse embryo, and they're sectioned at gastrulation. So this is arguably the most important event in embryogenesis. It's when the germ layers are being laid down. And even if you don't remember any embryology or never had any, if you just take your eyes back and forth and look at, say, the green cells and green cells and yellow cells and yellow cells and go back and forth like that, they don't look very similar. And it turns out that in the early period of post-implantation development, especially in the extra embryonic membranes and the placenta, human development and mouse development is just very different. And each of these each of these lineages have clinically relevant differences. So for example, this green tissue, the trophoblast here, is physically what connects the conceptus with the mother. So it's the outer layer of the placenta. And right around the time of implantation, the human embryo secretes a molecule called chorionic gonadotropin. And that's the molecule that tells the mother that she's pregnant and maintains the corpus luteum of pregnancy and menstruation is blocked. The mouse embryo, on the other hand, doesn't even have a homologous molecule to chorionic gonadotropin. It uses other mechanisms to do that. And if you're interested in the initial events of embryogenesis and you're interested in questions of infertility, um, the mouse model tells you a lot, but there's certain areas where it's simply not accurate. So I want to talk about one of the things we've been doing in this area. If you look at the right-hand panel, there are human embryonic stem cells in a large colony. And you can just watch this area here. This is a control. A single growth factor has been added here. And you'll see over this two-day time lapse, there's a synchronized wave of differentiation from the outside of the colony towards the inside. And this is with adding a single growth factor. And it turns out, unusually for embryonic stem cells, this turns out to be one single cell type. So it's synchronized and it goes to a single cell type. So it's a nice model. And the question is, what represented that? What, what kind of cell type did that represent? And in collaboration with Pat Brown's lab at Stanford, we did a lot of microarray analysis looking at the genes that expressed over time in this tissue. And this represents those results. And you read this by the time scales across here. So it's like zero, three hours, up to seven days. And these represent the changes in all the different genes. So red is increased and green is decreased. Uh, the bottom line here is this represents trophoblast. And trophoblast is that very special outer layer of the placenta and the one that mediates implantation and the early initiation of pregnancy. So this gives us a very good model to study some of the events of early human uh, pregnancy. This trophoblast secretes chorionic anatropin in the medium, the top panel, estradiols, and uh, progesterone, so it's functional. Um, and importantly, again, if you look at a particular marker of trophoblast, chorionic anatropin, and this is a fax analysis, the entire population is shifting to express that particular marker. So it gives us a very good model to study synchronized differentiation to a particular lineage that we can do in very large scale. So there are investigators interested in placenta, and, and I'm not um, primarily interested in that, but there are people in my lab interested in that. I'm interested in how this totipotent cell ex exits that state and becomes committed to something else. And this gives us a large scale synchronized method of doing that. So again, if you think about mouse development and human development, they're different. And we're extremely ignorant about the early events of human embryogenesis. It's basically all based on analogy to the mouse. A few very limited sections of the Carnegie collection. But you can't directly study that post-implantation embryo because you jeopardize the potential health of the resulting child. And we've never had a good model to study these events before. So this is a brand new window into a model that should tell us how it hopes about infertility, miscarriages, and birth defects. So one of the practical things my lab works on is the culture of human embryonic stem cells. And it, when we first derived these, they're derived on a background of embryonic fibroblasts from a mouse. And they included serum components and a variety of other components from animals. And at the time, I was deriving them very specifically for research purposes. I figured other people would do them 
in better conditions. And it turned out that our cell lines ended up being important because there's only a few cell lines in the United States you can use right now, but we didn't know that at the time. And we found out very quickly that FGF, a particular growth factor with a particular serum substitute that's proprietary, um, allows the clonal growth of these cells on fibroblastin. So it's a, kind of a serum-free growth, but there's kind of a, a mixture of proteins in there. And, and we had a lot, long time where we didn't have a lot of good results on this, and we found out that in our standard tissue culture medium, there's actually things inducing differentiation, because we have a mindset that fibroblasts are secreting something that was positive, because that's how it works in mouse embryonic stem cells. But it turns out it's different with these cells. And Renhe Shu in my lab did a particular experiment, a very simple one, where he took medium that was either conditioned from fibroblasts, and that supports undifferentiated growth quite well or unconditioned medium, and that causes rapid differentiation. And then he just took conditioned medium with basal medium with no protein supplements mixed 50-50, and that supported undifferentiated proliferation just fine. However, when he mixed the conditioned medium and unconditioned medium together, again, it caused this rapid differentiation. And what conditioning does is actually complex. It's adding good things and subtracting bad things. But the dominant early effect is inhibiting this differentiation ability. So because when he had already done these BMP studies in looking at trophoblast differentiation, it made sense to look at this particular growth factor in the medium. And it turns out that there's a lot of BMP activity in this unconditioned medium. And if you inhibit it, that you get good growth of the embryonic stem cells. And also, if you look at the conditioned medium, they're actually secreting inhibitors of this pathway called, called BMP, including noggin and, and gremlin. So he looked at the ability for the, this particular combination to sustain the cultures through multiple passages. And this graph is a little hard to read, but OCT4 is a particular marker of embryonic stem cells. And the number of OCT4 positive cells is on top, and the number of differentiated cells in the cultures on the bottom. So our kind of standard cultured medium is this conditioned medium, and that gives this effect. If you look at unconditioned medium with this noggin inhibiting BMPs and you add fiberglass growth factor, it's indistinguishable from conditioned medium statistically. And through prolonged passages, again, it's indistinguishable from the conditioned medium. So this is a big simplification of the medium. Um, it's not completely defined because there's still some bad things in that serum replacer. Um, he also looked at population doubling times and conditioned medium in this particular specialized medium is the same. And he's cultured these cells out now for several months, and we have several cell lines, and they've all gone um, for several months. The percentage of undifferentiated markers is the same. Population doubling times are the same, and they still have the same developmental potential as the cells we started with. And one of the areas um, that we're looking at is the, the activity of BMP signaling in these cells. And we found out fairly late when we are doing this that FGF itself suppresses this pathway. And if you look at this, if you go from conditioned medium, adding BMP, adding more BMP, you see an increase of BMP activity. If you see straight medium and then you add more of the serum replacer, you also see more BMP activity. And this is increasing concentrations of FGF. And all the experiments I had just told you were done at this concentration where there's this partial suppression of BMP. But we noticed that if you added enough, it actually completely suppressed the BMP pathway. So we went back and said, you actually need the noggin to suppress it. And Mark Levenstein did this work. And it turns out that at high concentrations of FGF, um, you, you inhibit this background differentiation that you see at lower concentrations. And this is perfectly acceptable for long-term culture. And, and importantly, if you do um, a bunch of serial passages where you count all the cells and look at doubling times, um, the unconditioned medium supplement of FGF matches conditioned medium. It, it behaves just as well. And we're not sure why you need these rather huge concentrations of FGF, but it's partially explained by stability, but not entirely. If you look at the stability of FGF in the fridge, it's pretty stable. If you put them on cells, it degrades at a pretty fast rate, and conditioned medium dramatically reduces that rate. So it appears that there are things in conditioned medium that binds it. Nonetheless, if you look at 24-hour periods, there's still a lot of FGF there. And we think that there are things that need to be bound to FGF, like heparin sulfate proteoglycans, that you need to get high affinity receptor interactions to get it down to a level that's um, more normal, which is more like 4 nanograms. So we're now looking at cofactors of FGF signal to get the, the levels down to something more reasonable. We've also looked at all the comparative analysis between the existing embryonic stem cell lines, their malignant equivalents, which are called teratocarcinomas, and a bunch of somatic cells. 
And we've identified a core set of genes which are interesting to us um, to understand this pluripotent state. And there's quite a large list of them, but we're concentrating on, on a subset of those. But the other thing that that analysis did is it gave us all the receptors that, that are, are expressed by embryonic stem cells so we could add growth factors in a more rational way. Um, and these are just a list of receptors. And after um, a couple years of adding growth factors, we have a pretty long list of growth factors that have a positive effect of self-renewal on these cells. I'll just mention one because it's in the literature, and that's the TGF beta or um, active in wherever that is, activating signaling pathway. There's a couple of papers saying that TGF beta active in signaling is essential for human embryonic stem cells, and it's not clear that it is, and it may well not be. And it's mainly based on this particular inhibitor that blocks that pathway. And it's a phosphorylation inhibitor of a key event. And indeed, when we take condition medium and add this inhibitor, you get rapid differentiation of human embryonic stem cells, what the literature says. But then if you go back and add noggin again, um, you inhibit this pattern. So it looks like the TGF beta pathway and the um, BMP pathway are kind of antagonistic to each other. And that the active and TGF beta pathway, when you activate it, inhibits BMPs. And if you inhibit the BMPs by some other mechanisms, you may or may not need active and TGF beta signaling. So I want to just pause on this slide a little bit. And for the non-biologists, this will be the last kind of heavy slide. Um, a lot of signaling is very context dependent. And people in this field are trying to make things a little too simplistic. Um, if you look at our standard tissue condition, t tissue culture conditions, active and TGF beta signaling looks like it's important. You block it and they differentiate rapidly. Uh, but it seems like it's only because there's already this BMP activity in, in the medium. And if you got rid of that, then the, the, the need for active and TGF beta signaling probably goes away. The FGF signaling is doing a lot of different things. One of the things is blocking this, this noggin, BMP pathway rather. Um, but it's doing other things too, and we're investigating those other things. But the point I want to make of this slide is that none of these things are the same as the mouse embryonic stem cells. They're all different. So in mouse embryonic stem cells, leukemia inhibiting factor is a major cytokine that's been used to culture those for you know, 15 years now or so. The, that, that particular receptor and the downstream bit of that pathway are, are either not expressed at all or essentially inactive. So the leukemia inhibiting factor does not sustain our cells. Austin Smith's recently showed if you take leukemia inhibiting factor and add BMPs and serum-free conditions, that supports mouse embryonic stem cells in the complete absence of serum. Under every condition we've tested, BMPs actually cause the differentiation of human embryonic stem cells, so it's at least superficially backwards. But the caution here is that, again, it's, it's, it's context-dependent, and we don't have a LIF equivalent. And it's very possible if there's something playing the role of LIF, we'd come back with BMPs and suddenly be a positive acting factor. Um, so it's kind of a work in progress. So now, now that you survived that, why, why should you care about all the media stuff? Um, so human embryonic stem cells, we derived them, you know, 1998. There are five original cell lines, and they were exposed to rabbit proteins, guinea pig proteins, cow, and mouse. And again, I derived those entirely for experimental purposes. I never thought that they'd go into human bodies, and there are people that are gearing up to put them into human bodies. And these new culture conditions of ours and of other people really do suggest that new cell lines will be derived without these problems, and they will be qualitatively different from the original cell lines. So we derived these five cell lines in 1998, and we didn't bother driving any more because my feeling at the time was it wasn't a whole, whole lot of point in driving more with the same exact problems. But I think that's changed now. I think the medium has changed enough that we can go back and do it right so that they're much safer cell lines. And in the United States, there's now about 400,000 frozen embryos produced from IVF. And it's not clear how many of these are going to be discarded, but a very significant proportion of them are going to be discarded. And the current federal policy, George Bush's policy, was that cell lines derived prior to August of 2001 could be federally funded, and anything after that can't be. Um, the, the unintended effect of that policy is not that embryos are saved, but the patients merely discard them instead of donating them to research because so few investigators can use them. Um, and I think given that the field has changed qualitatively now, it's a good time to change that policy. So back to my summary, and then I'll open up to questions. Um, why are these cells so important? And I mentioned this analogy earlier in the day with some people. I think there's a lot of analogies with recombinant DNA in the in 1970s with human embryonic stem cell research. There's a si similar kind of social controversy. And it was followed by compromise, and people got on with the work. And that's already happening with human yes cell research. And there's some other parallels, too. If you think about the early days of recombinant DNA, 
and if you had people sitting around the table and kind of figuring out where this field was going. Um, I think that most people would have thought that gene therapy would be one of the applications that would be pretty easy. And it turns out, you know, 30 years in or so, it's turned out to be a really tough one. I think there's going to be parallels with transplantation biology and embryonic stem cells. It is going to be very important someday, but it's going to take a lot of time and there's a lot of challenges to get over. And I think another area that people kind of misjudged um, is scientists knew it was extremely important, but they had no sense of how pervasive the technology would be. I think that the idea that we'd be using this things like you know, anthropology and forensics and things, I don't think the average biology got that in the 1970s. I think that's going to be true of embryonic stem cells too. And I think that the take-home message here is that this is just a wonderful research tool for understanding the human body because it gives you good access. And the analogy within the common DNA field I like is PCR. It's what PCR did for individual DNA molecules, embryonic stem cells does for the human body. It simply gives you access that was difficult to study because it was inaccessible before. And I, I don't know where the field is going. I know where my little niche in it is. Um, but I think as these cells get out across campuses across the world, we'll find a lot of people using them in ways that we simply never predicted. And those ways will impact human medicine also in ways we've never predicted. Because a lot of the basic biology that we're going to learn about um, will be applied to things that have absolutely nothing to do with transplantation biology and absolutely nothing with the particular areas that I'm interested in. Uh, but it'll be an exciting field over the next couple of years. Okay, I'd like to end there and be glad to ask questions. So I purposely didn't talk about ethics or politics, but I'd be glad to address this question if you care to. Um, so I, I'll kind of just a general question on cloning. Uh, the question of cloning and, and where's it going, basically. Um, I didn't talk about what's called therapeutic cloning. If you looked at the papers that the Korean have, Korean, Koreans have done recently, it's actually relatively efficient. It's much more efficient than I thought it would be so early on. However, um, so therapeutic cloning, for those of you who don't know, is taking a, a nucleus from an adult cell, transferring it to an oocyte, growing that product to a point where you can grow stem cell lines, hope with the intent of someday differentiating that to something therapeutic usually and putting back into the patient. Now, my problem with it is how many sentences it took me to explain that. Because if you actually look at the economics of it, um, you're starting with a clonal event, and they, these cells have a population doubling time of about 30 hours or so. So to go from that one cell up to you know, 10 to the ninth or something useful, you're talking about months. And there's the availability of the oocytes and then a whole team of very qualified people having to take it up to the point where it's you know, something useful to go back for transplantation. I think that the economics will be so badly against it that other technologies will simply go around it over time. So although I don't see any biological reasons why therapeutic cloning couldn't work, I've never been a big um, vocal proponent of it because I just think technologies will go elsewhere. Whereabouts? Okay. Um, I'd like you to explain the slide in your PowerPoint that you gave. Yeah, which one? Like up and back from the end. What it looked like? There's a, a characteristic tree, I think, at the top, and I'd like you to explain it. 
for the board. Yeah. Sorry, so what was it? Time? There's a characteristic tree at the top of one of your slides. It was one of those. One of these? There was a, a whole bunch of the different, oh, with the conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Um, this that one? Idea, yeah. <laughs> Okay. This one? No, it's the first one that popped up. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can just, you can give me like colors. Yeah. 38? Okay, sorry. Sure. Can you explain? Yeah, sure. Also the three on top as well. Yeah, so what this was, this is a collaboration with Pat Brown. And we, we went after as many pluripotent germ cell tumors as we get our hands on. And these are the malignant equivalent embryonic stem cells and they're called embryonic carcinomas. And they have a variety of um, chromosomal changes. So the idea was that if, if we saw a shared pattern, it's like shuffling a poker deck, in that if something really important is there, if it was lost, it wouldn't be an embryonic stem cell anymore, or an embryonic carcinoma cell. So we compared a, a whole bunch of those cell lines and then a whole bunch of somatic cells. And what the little tree at the top is, it's a clustering algorithm for seeing how close these different cell types are together. So if you look, just a second. What's that? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. What sort of indexes are you using to figure out how closely people are, how closely related to the cell types? So this is Pat Brown's tree view program. It's a, a particular clustering algorithm, which I couldn't tell you on the part. Don't. Okay. So if you look at the embryonic carcinomas, they cluster right next to embryonic stem cells and they cluster together. All the embryonic stem cells are very closely related. Seminomas are a different kind of germ cell tumor. They have some similarities but some differences from these other ones. And there's clusters of genes which are shared with the seminomas and, and clusters of genes which are just shared with the embryonic carcinoma cells. And these include known pluripotency genes like OCT4, which is a very specific one a lot of people are interested in. Um, but there's a rather, rather large cluster of transcription factors here. Over here. So it's a rather long question about the, the differences between mouse and human. Um, they seem to be real, and it doesn't seem like you know there's just another LIF equivalent molecule. People have looked downstream at JAK-STAT signaling, and it's essentially inactive. And people have been able, I think people even overexpressed um, active STAT3 and not seen effects so far. Um, there might be something kind of equivalent to LIF, not directly going through STAT3, and that hasn't been addressed yet. And there may well be something undiscovered that does that. Um, but the BMP part, it really does seem to be backwards so far. So if you take BMPs and add it to mouse CS cells that are grown with LIF and serum, it helps them a little bit. It doesn't get worse all of a sudden. Um, if you take the BMPs and add it to fibroblasts in our standard culture conditions, it always causes differentiation. Now, it is true that we might find something to balance that someday, but it hasn't been discovered so much. 
Um, the FGF story in the mouse I'm a little confused about because there's at least one paper saying FGF4 is essential, um, but you don't need it for cloning them. So you can actually clone them in serum-free medium with BMPs and LIF, and that's all you need. And they might possibly secrete themselves, but at clonal density, it's pretty unlikely. Um, so it, it doesn't appear to be a terribly important pathway as far as maintenance. Whereas the human yes cells, it's the major dominant factor. We can grow them in that plus you know, a serum substitute, basically. So it, it, the differences are, are, different, are, are more than I anticipated. It'd be nice to see a little more commonalities. When you get down to the transcription factors, it is a fair amount of commonalities. Um, but the upstream stuff has all been different so far. Well, at least to date, it's not looking like small changes. Um, it, there actually is an open question about whether human embryonic stem cells and mouse embryonic stem cells represent the same cell type. I mean, the markers are different. And just because you start with a blastocyst doesn't mean that you end up at the same stage. And this may recapitulate difference in germ cell tumors also. There, there's different biology of how germ cell tumors arise in man versus mice. And it could be these signaling pathways just are different. We don't know yet. But it, it's, it's surprisingly different. You like to see them come together in some kind of commonality, and they're not yet. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Professor, I'm Jim Meadows with WIL Radio. And I just wanted to ask your comments on the, uh, the research findings that are in the news now. I think they were uh, referred to in the, in the introduction to your speech from Advanced Cell Technology and the and the Whitehead Institute about um, uh, new ways of producing stem cells without actually uh, uh, making use or destroying, without the actual destruction of embryos. Do you think these processes pose the same potential for uh, research and development as um, other methods of producing stem cells? You, um, yeah, so the, the, I haven't actually seen the reports, and I didn't see the paper this morning, but I'm familiar with them. Uh, one report showed that you could take a single one of those blastomeres, which I showed you on the first slide, from a mouse embryo, not from a human. And it was possible under certain conditions to drive embryonic stem cells. There's no reason to expect that they would be biologically different. Um, it's not entirely clear whether you could do the same thing in human, but you should be able to if you figured out how to do it. Um, the problem I have is that when you think about actually how you want to use that, um, one way is if you actually wanted to store a stem cell line for a child being born through in vitro fertilization, and couples may, way, may well want to do that. Um, but usually when you're about to have, if, you want, if you're infertile, you want to increase the chances of having that baby, and that's, that's the goal of in vitro fertilization. And anything that perturbs the embryo detracts from that goal. Um, so the, the couples might balance and decide to make such a, a cell line. However, for the, the existing embryos that the couples plan to discard, um, it doesn't seem directly applicable. Uh, it's true that you could biopsy a, a, a blastomere and derive a cell line, but it still leaves you with the question of what to do with these embryos, and the fact is they're going to be discarded. Yeah, it doesn't solve that problem. So it, it's, it's, I can see a particular application for it, but it doesn't solve the general problem. If I could ask you one, one follow-up question, if you could talk a little bit about uh, any research being done uh, in the production of stem cells from adult uh, cellular tissue, and if that 
in your mind, uh, has any promise of uh, um, producing any productive research? Oh, well, certainly over time. time. It's, it's a question, question is we don't know how much time. Um, so, so there was a paper from um, uh, Harvard a couple of weeks ago about cell fusions. And it's actually known since the 70s that that works with mouse cells. And this was where you take an adult cell and you fuse it with an embryonic stem cell and look at the product. And that heterocarion sometimes has the phenotype, the, the, the embryonic stem cell. And basically what that is a, re is a research program. It's not a, it's not a finding that's useful yet. Um, it simply gives you a model to show that it is under certain circumstances possible to reprogram an adult cell. And there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to do that. And one day we will, but it's not clear how difficult a problem it is. It might be a very challenging one. You think embryonic stem cell research can produce results more quickly? Um, or it just or it has a, a broader potential? Yeah, so if, if you reprogram an adult cell, it will be an embryonic stem cell. Uh, no, we, well, we published part of this, but not all of it. And um, a number of people have, have, have reproduced our results of what we've published, um, but they haven't taken it beyond that, per se. Not, not our medium. Other people have some comparable medium they're working on. So there are other, other labs developing fairly similar medium that are fibroblast-free and don't have these serum problems anymore. And the implication of that is that we should be able to drive more cell lines, whether it's our group or another one, which don't have the problems of contamination that the presidentially approved ones have. So no one is just at the research at this stage? Uh, nothing published yet. Summarize the first one by saying you look, you're wondering about stem cells rather than the embryonic stem cells. So for the purpose of transplantation of the organs and damaged tissues, it seems like the, uh, the somatic stem cell has uh, quite a bit of promising, or at least it has, some, it has made some progresses compared to the uh, embryonic stem cells. So for that area of the purpose, uh, do you think that the uh, somatic stem cells would be showing more promising future? So uh, let me back up a little bit and talk about this debate, uh, this divide between adult and embryonic stem cells. I'll put one slide out. Um, 
This is really not a scientific debate because it, it's more of a policy and political debate. And it, 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 the analogy I like here as a development biologist, if you study C. elegans or Drosophila or Xenopus or mice, and you wouldn't argue about, about which one's better. better. It's either choose the best, best one for the particular, particular question if you're asking. Yeah. This is the same thing, is that there's some things for which embryonic stem cells give a better model to ask those questions. And I don't know whether at the end of the day it'll be more practical and cost effective to transplant adult or embryonic derived stuff. Um, but I guarantee you that those therapies will come quicker if you allow oh, researchers, researchers to study both embryonic and adult. And, and people who have already, people with predominantly study adult and stem, stem cells, cells using human and stem cells, it's also going back and forth with choosing which ones most appropriate for which question. Um, and I think there's I don't have a good crystal ball about you know, what therapies will be derived from human embryonic stem cells, but the fact that you can grow them in sustainable and limited amounts pretty easily is a pretty big part of the thing. And it might be possible to do that adult stem cells at some time. But for most adult stem cells, you can't. It's actually very difficult to grow them in therapies of body. It remains to be seen how they'll change. Your second question is about the politics of uh, the United States versus the rest of the world in embryonic stem cell research. There certainly are very huge investments being made in China and Korea and Singapore and elsewhere. Um, and we'll just be one of the players in the future. I don't think, um, it's not clear to me that the United States will be the dominant player in this or not. We also won't be left behind entirely. I think we'll make very viable contributions. And I do think that um, a lot of the current restrictions will go by the wayside when President Bush leaves. But the investments that are make, being made state by state now are rivaling what foreign governments are investing. And especially if the California initiative goes forward, um, they'll be a country unto their own when they have superb researchers there. Um, I actually was considering getting more into the clinical side of um, gene therapy. Uh, are there any new uh, like methods of doing that that you're aware of? Or how is like, this being transferred to? Unfortunately, they're kind of different fields for me. Uh, there are people that think that genetically modified yes cells provide a good vehicle for gene therapy, but it's unfortunately not what I do. That there's only one strain or substrain of mouse that you can derive these ES stem cells, and I was wondering if that is true, why is that? No, it's not true, but there's one that predominates, and there's been very difficult ones, and people have come up with ways to drive them from additional cell, from additional strains, and the genetics of why that's true is not understood. I was wondering to what extent your research, or the research of your colleagues, has been affected by the federal policy on the ban on donating embryonic cell embryos. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, from 1998 to 2001, there was no federal dollars for this at all. And my university's opinion was that you could use absolutely no federally funded equipment, even if it was on a previous grant, and then we couldn't isolate RNA and use a microarray facility, for example. So we were basically stopped with very limited funds to, to carry this out. Um, the, the compromise that George Bush came up with um, while it doesn't represent good public policy, it did open the door, and there are no restrictions on what you can apply for for NIH for the existing cell lines, basically. They're just like any other cell lines, and they compete in the same pool of grants as everybody else, and compete head, head, head uh, Where it's gonna change is, is uh, if people are interested in, in comparing a genetically diverse set of cell lines, we don't have one, it's a very, you know, uh, very, very narrow set. And clinically, if this does move towards the clinics, the existing cell lines um, do have problems, and it would be much better to drive more. You got the last word. Thank you. Um, so you did this comparison between uh, applied stem cells and uh, the Hegel cell for gene selection purposes. Um, I'm wondering uh, why is that uh, of interest to you? Because it seems to me that the trachoma cells are very different. Besides that, they, they proliferate as much as stem cells. Um, I'm just trying to get some more intuition from you why you think they are 
keratoma on the cells together with the brain stem cells to be helpful. Uh, could you repeat a little louder? Okay. Okay. We did this comparison uh, between teratoma cells and the brown stem cells for the purpose of selecting genes. Um, I, I would like to get more intuition from you why you think this approach is useful in any way. Um, I understand that teratoma cells are still very uh, proliferative, but the, it's, a, it's a, such a mess of different things. No, these are the, the, the stem cells of teratomas. The so, so, so the stem cell teratoma is called embryonic carcinoma cell, and it's a pluripotent stem cell that can give rise to three germ layers, and it's essentially the malignant equivalent to embryonic stem cells. We're not comparing the differentiated stuff, just the undifferentiated stem cell. Oh, so, so the idea is basically to get the genes that show up in common. Right. Among the two, and that's answer. Because, and then, heightened self-renewal state, they're still like embryonic stem cells, there's a malignant one, so we want to see what was it thrown out, because they do throw a lot of genes out, we want to see what's maintained. But what's, what's in common? Yeah, we're looking for commonalities. 